Warning, the following video contains major spoilers from the My Little Pony A New Generation movie, so if you haven't seen the film yet, I seriously recommend watching it before going into this review. Do leave a like on this video on your way out though. Cheers. <sighs> So, here we go. Welcome, Fluffbutts, to a very special yay or nay review on My Little Pony A New Generation. I knew I was going to make this video, considering how much attraction my reaction videos got. Not to brag, but seriously, I appreciate all of you so much that followed me on this journey to this exact point. So, let's not waste any time, and let's start this mega review. In October 2019, Friendship is Magic had finally ended its near-decade run with an episode that shattered our hearts. Due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic that erupted in 2020, it took us almost two years to be given more information on Generation 5. As we smoothly ignore the acid trip that was Pony Life, Pony in February 2021, we got our first look of what kind of generation would be awaiting us. Netflix and Hasbro collaborated to create a whole new world with CGI stylized ponies that would transpire in the far future, even further than the events that took place in the episode The Last Problem. However, some people weren't particularly happy. The dislike for what was going to be the next spin on the MLP universe was quite persistent. Even petitions came out demanding for season 9 to get a better ending. Like, was that necessary, guys? This needs to stop now! And finally, after many months of patience, the movie came out for everyone to enjoy. And let me tell you, I actually enjoyed it. Not only did it interest me early on, I was firmly kept entertained throughout. A new generation features an enthusiastic Sunny Star Scout embarking on a journey with a hoofful of brand new characters as they try to restore harmony to a reinvigorated but segregated Equestria. Was a new generation a failed attempt of introducing a new era to MLP, or is it actually the perfect continuation that the franchise needed? Okay guys, I love you lots, gotta go. Pip pip hooray! Pip pip hooray! Well, grab your gemstones and wear some Alicorn cosplay, because we're gonna take a ride through the pilot of Generation 5. Hold tight, because this will be a long one. Before we begin, let me just say this. This movie had the biggest responsibility of taking up the torch compared to when previous generations of MLP were introduced. Knowing how beloved Friendship is Magic became, and with the movie being a follow-up to that, a new generation would have needed to answer a ton of questions to defend its credibility. Like... What happened to the main six? How far in the future does this take place in? What caused Harmony to be separated? Where did the iconic locations go? Why did Earth Ponies, Unicorns, and Pegasi turn on one another? Where are the Windingos? How did the crystals get made? Where did the Alicorns go? Are there any more Alicorns? <sighs> and does a new generation answer any of those questions? Mm. Let's find out! The movie begins with a wonderful callback to the show, and hell, even Angel gets a cameo here. Turns out that that was only the imaginative leisure of three kids, Sunny, Hitch, and Sprout. Let me emphasize on this point now. The animation style of the movie is brilliant. It provides more realistic detail to the world it's set in. It also contrasts nicely to the whole premise. A new set of characters, a new setting, a new generation of My Little Pony, and therefore, a a new style of animation set apart from the usual 2D antics the franchise has always used. The activities the three kids engaging in were a great slice of characterization, showing us straight away who our main characters are. Sunny as this enthusiastic idealist, Hitch as her lawful but tolerable best friend, and Sprout... Ugh, I can't take him seriously. My mom says the Pegasi and Unicorns try to eat up all the Earth Ponies by zapping him with lasers and frying him to a crisp. He's so predictably antagonistic that all of his dialogue in this scene was so one-dimensional. When all three pony kinds were friends. Ah. Uh. Here we go again. As the camera pans down through the house, we get a big display of references to Generation 4, establishing that Generation 5 takes place in the same world. But it's a little frustrating how vague the insistences are. She's been keeping us safe and stylish for the last 20 moons. Well, apart from this comment. For the last 20 moons. Bah, 
We then get introduced to Argyle and Phyllis when they both argue over each other's beliefs. The political undertones that this film explains between these two optimistic characters were awesome. Racial segregation is a definite theme in the movie. But then that raises the question, where are the Windingos? And I've got a simple answer to that. There are none. Windingos feed off of hatred and fighting, and not once in the film does it show all three species of ponies rebelling against each other, like in Ending of the End. It's really only Sonny and Izzy's appearances that startle them, and yeah, the Windingos wouldn't appear since the girls are always easily disposed of and forgotten of. When I become sheriff, I'll keep every pony in line. <laughs> not. What happens next with Argyle and Sonny was absolutely heartwarming. Seeing the pair of them opening up to each other and the unicorn pegasus cosplay made me stare in awe. The sending of the lantern letter was adorable and I can't believe that Sonny's alicorn transformation went over my head here. But now, get ready to gush because this bit in the bedroom just fucking broke me. She soon made lots of new friends. Earth ponies, pegasuses, and unicorns. I was left in tears realizing that the previous generation was reduced to being children's bedtime stories and forgotten tales of old. When Argyle switched on the lamp, it was bloody marvelous. The bedroom came to life, and knowing in hindsight that the last crystal was inside the lamp itself, the scene's rewatch value just increased. The solution to Sunny's problems was shining right in front of her as a kid. Perfection. <laughs> Magnifique! We time skipped to show a matured Sonny without Argyle to be found, which was a little disappointing. He was such an interesting character at the start, and then he gets written out in a cliche way. All of that gets put on hold though with the first song in the film, Gonna Be My Day. My number one favorite, and it's fantastic. It gives the appearance of Mare Time Bay a sense of vibrancy with its many long shots as we follow Sunny around the town. Only Sprout's cameo in this scene lets it down for me. However, I want to see Harry Trotter and the Stable of Secrets, please. <laughs> When Hitch and Sonny go back and forth on each other, I found their friendship really convincing, even to the point where they have a special hoof shake. Up high, down low, hitch it to a post, flip it sunny side, side up and on a piece of toast. toast. Hmm, now where has this come from? Sunshine, sunshine, lady likes the wake. Clap your hooves and do a little shake. I knew it! The inside of the Cantalogic factory was rather the extended sight to behold. I can't help but sense Mayor Bellwether vibes from Phyllis in this first act. Underneath her wealthy businesswoman approachability, she's presented as an unyielding autocrat who builds a nation out of scaring people, manipulating the truth for an ethical agenda or profit or, in her case, power. Those aspects alone makes her more worthy of being the antagonist rather than her son. But mommy, I in Shut the fuck up, you cunt! I was in stitches with the catwalk hijinks with the balloon guy and the chaser dude until Sunny ran on stage to protest against Phyllis's presentation. Didn't she notice the glass panels blocking her speech? It will just fall upon deaf ears. You can tell this is the case because her voice is muffled behind the glass when Phyllis is talking in front of the glass. So, now you can prevent an aerial abduction. What follows afterwards when the experts fail to pull the plug to abort the operation that was apparently fully automated was great. The tension between the confidence of Sonny and the pertinacious demeanor of Phyllis was amazing. Sonny gets booed off the stage by the audience, which was disgusting, but I kept smiling how Hitch didn't wish to give her a harsher treatment. Come on, let's go. Show's over, Sonny. Sonny, you're just embarrassing yourself. Shut up! Sonny and Hitch are seen discussing outside, and this is where both of them really start to shine through. Sonny chaotically challenges Hitch's goodwill with his lawful conduct, but he reluctantly rejects her ideas. He doesn't lash out on her because he understands where she's coming from, but he tragically doesn't believe her. Come on, Sonny, what did you think was gonna happen? He knows where his loyalties lie, with the law, while staying headstrong about his friends. You keep saying there's nothing to be afraid of, well then prove it! Now, that was an outstanding line. Hi, new friend! My name's Izzy! 
I'm not gonna lie, Izzy's introduction was immensely funny. The change in atmosphere from the quiet streets to sudden panic was effective to show how much the three species despise each other. Unicorn attack! Hitch's rescue of a mistaken child was hilarious, and I loved how Sunny was the only one helping Izzy escape. Earth ponies hate unicorns. Really? That seems a little harsh. That was my exact reaction to her response. Wow! I adored the use of increasing close-ups on Hitch and Sunny's faces to heighten the pressure on who's more daring. Don't even think about it. But am I gonna? Nope. Sunny! We get to the inside of the lighthouse, and I appreciated the calm ambiance of this segment, comparing with the explosion of action earlier. Sunny's abundance of questions firing at Izzy felt natural for her curious character, and the reveal of Izzy not having magic was surprising. You don't have any magic? No. But I can do this! <laughs> Can't forget about them smexy beans. As the girls insist on sneaking away from the boys, I found their diversion efficient. I know what you're thinking. Ah, she's already reading her mind. Sprout's fright allowed the girls to escape behind Hitch's back. Classic. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. When the two mares escape, I found the Chinese whispers concept that's established between the three species interesting. You don't smell. Thanks. Wait, what? I was told all you earth ponies smell like rotten sardines. An array of distorted rumors would undoubtedly get passed on throughout the years. Sunny and Izzy's quest to go to Zephyr Heights leads into the second song. I'm looking out for you. And it's delightful. The song's message enhances a joyful message to all the young and old viewers that relying on one another can help build your friendship stronger. Not to mention the rapid fire montage of all the different locations that the future show could explore was nice. But I do admit, this movie hardly allows for any world building to happen. Sure, we get dedicated sections in Maritime Bay, Bridalwood, and Zephyr Heights, but there's not much else. Although that's what pilots in the media tend to be like, making sure that the main settings are brought in while only teasing potential others. How could this happen in me? We transition to the sheriff's office and Hitch insists on finding Sunny while Sprout goes on and on about his jealousy of Hitch. Every pony loves Hitch. Sure, he's got perfect mane, shredded abs, paid off mortgage. I seriously don't understand Sprout's sudden dislike of Hitch. He offers him a chance to investigate the world with him, but he declines just because. It would have been the perfect time to redeem Sprout by allowing him to explain his motives or fright to Hitch, but no. Why should I care about him becoming the sheriff when everything he does is lacking death to support his level of reasoning? But damn, give me that Hitch calendar! Say no more, say no more now, I mean, nudge nudge! You do know Pegasi can steal your luminescence, don't you? Was that a secret reference to Rainbow Factory? Okay, I'm now a little disturbed. <laughs> The spooky section of an unknown figure chasing after the girls was cool to include, especially coming off the notion that The Pegasi are bad news! This is when we get introduced to Zipharina! Wow, Zip has got to be one of my absolute favorite characters in this movie. Okay, well this day just got a whole lot more interesting. Oh! After Zip flies away, the interaction between the two royal guards was amusing, and it was gratifying to see the tennis ball getting its usage. Fine, I've got this. I laughed so hard at this moment. And then we get to properly see Zephyr Heights. These establishing shots were magnificent, but seeing all of the parodied brands took me right out of the immersion. I understand that this stuff may be fun to some people seeing it on screen, but to me, I'm not really a fan of it. Other than all that rubbish, the design of the whole location was visually appealing. The overuse of warm colors and metallic textures show in detail the environmental advancement of Pegasi. The pup getting mistaken for the queen was chuckle-worthy, and I always love Queen Haven, Pip, and Zip's entrance. I can't deny, but think that rarity was an inspiration behind Haven's character, looking and behaving sophisticatedly while addressing the guards unimportantly. No pony must know they're here. Check it out, Pipsqueaks. 
live from the castle. What the f What a way to make everyone unexpectedly afraid, Pip. I have to be honest, Pip is irritating in her first scenes, mainly caring about her online reputation without any regard of the real damage she'd make in the process. <laughs> What? No, no. When Haven confiscated Sunny's journal, it felt a little underwhelming. Not a single bit of struggle from Sunny when the guard took it from her and began reading it. She gave it up too easily. We then get quite a humorous cut from Sunny and Izzy being captured to Sprout sticking his face on hitches. Shit is it? Okay, that was genuinely funny. Just as the citizens demand answers for what's going on with Hitch being gone, Sprout immediately shows off dominance with his corrupted way of thinking. Unicorns could come back. They could even bring the Pegasi. We are all in danger. This leads into the third song of the film. Danger, danger. And dearie me. It's astounding. The lesser amount of saturation was a lovely touch to show off Sprout's threatening aura, and here, he actually feels convincing as a powerful figure. He's a little disturbing in this segment, in fact. If you follow my orders brainlessly. That strength in numbers message was appropriate, and I will always love a good villain song. Oh, heck yeah! This princess smells so good you. Perfume la pipe. The placement of Pip's perfume advert was rather strange. I have no idea why this is even in here. Seeing the Lux Dungeon in its entirety was priceless. It's almost like something out of Wreck-It Ralph. I'll lock you in my Fungeon. Fungeon? Fun Dungeon. For She-Ra. This is your prison? Technically, it's the spare room. We removed the cushions. Most of the cushions. Zip then comes along to have a talk with the girls, and I loved this single shot of the three of them. The dark and lit halves of the corridors separated by the Lux Dungeon bars were wonderful. Zip is enveloped in the light, giving the impression that she's another glimmer of hope to join our heroes. It's not fair, but that's just the way it is. If there was some way we could teach the citizens to fly, you know we wouldn't a wing beat. Spare me your overblown ego! Pip's arrival bugged me so much. It's the fact that the the only reason she visits the Lux Dungeon is so that she can do it for the content. Then why are you here? <laughs> for the content. Doing it happily without any remorse for the prisoners just made me groan. Then Zip releases Sunny and Izzy and I was left completely baffled by how easy it was to let them out. Was there really not any security guarding the cell or maybe could have the touch only worked for the guards? Nobody breaks the law on my watch! Next scene turns out that Hitch has been following Sonny's tracks ever since we last saw him in Maritime Bay. His show-off tomfoolery with the bun-buns leads to quite possibly the best shot in the film! No trail too dangerous, no clue too small. Oh boy, where do I start? Hitch comedically expressing his desire of catching Sonny and Izzy in a wide shot before the clouds shift apart to reveal all of his answers produced so many laughs out of me. The gigantic size of the buildings behind Hitch renders his appearance being harmless as a threat, and I love how Sonny and Izzy show different expressions in their mug shots. The bunnies were only an adorable addition to the segment which I truly appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Zip then takes Sunny and Izzy to an abandoned train station, and this was a bit emotionally hitting. Even a poster of the Wonderbolts gets shown, and the nostalgia in me exploded. Seems that the makers have watched Jurassic World before, but then this throws a massive spanner in the works. When did this place get built? I need answers. To be honest, this whole section of the film is a big question mark that demands answers, and it's such a shame that we hardly get any acknowledgement of that fact. We only have Twilight's cutie mark and the species crystals on the stained windows to go off of. It's a shame. As Sunny, Izzy and Zip discuss how they will plan to steal Queen Haven's crown, what occurred next confused me somehow. It was nice to get a James Bond style montage of clips of what the girls intend to do to make sure they succeed, but that was legitimately it. I was half expecting the montage to be an imagination of what they were thinking in the station beforehand, and then we get a full segment of them actually doing the stuff. It feels moderately cheap and rushed to cut out what the audience wished to see. 
I hear you paid our guests a visit. But didn't you say you would pay them a visit too earlier? Please escort these ponies to the dungeon until I can question them properly. What? Then Zip's performance got underway and the fourth song Blowing up, kinda love came through and my, my, this whole scene is tense. Sonny and Izzy attempting to escape with the crown as the dog pursues them viciously, along with Hitch who manages to find them at last. When stuff that I love, you like why, I'm like what? Hitch in the spotlight was a hilarious intermission and the blaring music playing above the apprehension that gradually ramps up was unnerving before it reaches rock bottom when Pip gets exposed with strength. Rings. Take the song out of the scene and it's actually quite beautiful, encouraging the listeners to not be afraid of whom they are, symbolized by this lyric. Putting it into this segment, it drives the song ironically, given how Pip is literally hiding the secret that she actually can't fly. It's satisfying to see reality being slapped back in her face here. Ah, uh, cancel culture's coming for your rump, Pip. With alarms blasting away, our heroes muddle through the city. Convenient as it may be, the news section for showing us all of the public's reactions to what happened and Haven's arrest was entertaining. No comment. And no photos! Okay, one photo. A few moments later, I think I might have heard an error with a certain sound effect with what happens next. Repeat that back. You hear the sound of a can clinkering, but I do not see any metallic object around. This single audio mistake makes Pip's angry entrance sound out of place and kind of misdirected. You left me hanging there. Your spotlight. This is so not happening. <laughs> but we need that crystal. Have you lost your mind? I'll just shut up and let's move this along, shall we? <laughs> We cut back to the Cantalogic factory, and we at last find out what Sprout has been concocting. Just seeing Sprout behaving heartlessly towards the employees made me further resent him. Just make it work, okay? Back to work, glitter cupcake. I cheered at Phyllis starting to catch on to the impression that everything was starting to go out of control with her son. Oh dear, some pony's getting up. Big head. After a spooky teaser, we find the main five in the middle of daisy fields and this whole scene felt empty to me. Apart from the supposed Tree of Harmony being featured, which was pleasant to see, everything else was just the protagonists arguing over the events that have happened. Hoofing it across daisy fields looking for a magical crystal that doesn't even exist! Don't you trust me at all? You are the one that just got mom thrown in jail! Like, can't you put your petty rivalries aside and work together? Not to forget the scene with the broken bridge, that was also rather dull. This was the first point in the film where I thought it was starting to fast forward itself through the plot. More stupid arguments came out of the uselessness of this section, and to top it off... Izzy's unexplained strength easily solves the problem. I'm gonna need some context. One intriguing thing about the campfire that occurs next was how Sonny and Hitch's conversation earlier gets turned on its head. Now, Sonny is the one being lawful with good intentions, while Hitch is desperately trying to explain his reasons why he should return home. Are you sure about all this? Because if we just go back to Maritime Bay... What have we got to lose? When they all join together around the fire, their performances escalate into the sky when Izzy reveals the lantern letter that Sunny wrote during her childhood. It said I had friends in Maritime Bay. Oh my god, this moment was so charming. We'll do our part. Hoof to heart. It made the hoofs touching bit really sweet, and when Izzy said this line... I guess... I just don't want our adventure to end. It set the seeds up for the future. The unicorn forest does sound kind of magical. <laughs> Thanks to a swift transition, we get introduced to Bridalwood. Just like in Friendship is Magic Part 2, it was nice to see the dark contrast of the forest with the liveliness of Izzy singing her way through. Well I was blown away by the interior of Izzy's house. It's like a ginormous kid's playhouse. It displays Izzy's characterization in a creative but childish way. Then we get thrown into the fifth song. 
No, not that one. I'm on about this one. With a similar flow to Bab Seed, this song was definitely a Pinky-inspired song. The wild atmosphere of shots and colourful visuals allow for a geeky experience. I liked how each member got a part in the song too. This is a new low. You're gonna fit right in. <laughs> With the laughable slice of espionage implanted, we get to see the whole view of Bridalwood. The change in music was rather impactful to show the desolate aroma. In order to find out where the unicorn crystal is, our heroes have to traverse into a tea room or coffee shop or entertainment center? I found the inside of the tea room quite cozy, but what happens was a bit of a letdown. The chat with the supposed crystal pony, whose name doesn't even get mentioned, lasted it's so little and we immediately get another pony thrown into the mix. Alphabetal. Hey, uh. I'm sorry, but I have to bring this up with something I said about this bar scene in my reaction. What are those creatures? Like magical hedgehogs? Rolling their armadillos. Fuck's sake! Big talk for a little pony. I think you'll find I'm average height. What even is this response? The absurdity of this segment escalated further when Alphabetal brings... Forth the ultimate challenge! The DDR machine. Wait. Why are the crystals suddenly on the podiums? I thought Sunny placed them on the bar table. Continuity! You only need to win one out of three. <sighs> My man, you've already handed her the win with that comment. This dancing section was awkwardly paced. Oh, there goes nothing. I was not convinced that Sunny, a rookie, would instantly win the third round. Maybe the rounds could have lasted longer to show some progression of Sunny learning how to play. Johnny Orlando's song got pissed on here. Judging by Alphabetal's mature looks, maybe show him losing his breath the longer he danced, therefore giving Sunny more motivation to win. Or perhaps Hitch stepping in and convincing the small critters to cheat and let Sunny win. Such wasted potential. After Sunny wins, the main five's identities get exposed and the unicorns press on them to retrieve the crystal. Then Hitch shoots Chekhov's gun triumphantly. Magic wing feather! A funny moment knowing earlier that the unicorns are superstitious. They all escape and then Queen Haven rolls around. Hold up, I thought she got arrested. How did she escape? The Pegasi and unicorns confront each other ferociously before Sunny puts a stop to it. No pony has magic! Vowing to let magic thrive again. This segment was very predictable knowing that it wouldn't work in the first place. It felt like a dragged out climax. Ah, oh, just get to the point already! However, Sunny's dispirited behavior when she broke down with the crystals was effective. Why didn't it work, Daddy? Because it was all just make-believe. Good God, this moment is sad. Physically seeing her confidence evaporate was depressing. Just watching her repeatedly pressing the crystals together, hoping for something to happen, made my heart ache. Come on, work! Work, please. And Hitch. Oh, Hitch. I love him so much here. Walking up to support Sunny. Oh, fucking hell. This scene is amazing. <laughs> then Sunny comes back to the lighthouse where she has a mental breakdown. She's utterly hopeless that when she puts away the main six figurines and the lamp, it shredded me apart. She goes to the top where she finds a hint to the last piece of the crown and it leads to the second best shot in the movie. The lamp lighting up the scene was a thing of beauty, almost as if Argyle was encouraging his young daughter to keep going. It's ironically delightful that lighthouses are meant to provide beacons of hope for those lost on their way. It really makes you ponder if Argyle knew about the Earth Pony Crystal in the first place or it was destiny for Sunny. I know it's my destiny. 
Just as Sunny is determined to get the crystals back, the fireworks in the distance provide a sense of danger for our protagonists. But once they make it up the hill, it fell to pieces. The blatant imagery is terrible, and when Sprout arrived on cue to introduce his intentions, I just laughed out loud. So we don't have to fight? Oh, that's a relief. The mind reading hats did fuck all to convince the residents to join him, and then, out of nowhere, a Transformers ripoff came out through the floor. Say hello to Sprouticus Maximus. Are you serious? This whole ending concerning Sprout's character was so stupid, and it wasn't satisfying enough when he eventually goes overboard. The inclusion of the Europe symbol too was enough for me to not take this seriously. We don't need any of that around here! The whole chase fiasco combined with Sprout's laughing fits made me laugh for the wrong reasons. Although, the final battle involving them struggling to get the crystals back together was rather eye-catching, Phyllis even proving herself to be a reliable character when she demands Sprout to stop the madness. Let's put the toy away! Mommy! Mommy! Please, I'm in the middle of something! You come down from there right now! Ugh. Even if no one ultimately got hurt, seeing the lighthouse being demolished was really sad. The movie then gives the biggest nod to Generation 4 when Sunny realizes that the crystals weren't important after all. It's not the crystals that need to be brought together, it's us. It was them and unifying everyone again. We can stay separated by fear and distrust, or we can choose friendship. <laughs> This whole solution may seem fast paced and a little contrived, but I couldn't imagine it going any other way. I loved seeing Alpha Bittle, Queen Haven, and Phyllis offering a hoof to put the photo frame back together. Then, suddenly. Sunny becomes an alicorn! Or does she? This whole transformation is rather mixed in the fandom. Some people believe it's permanent, and some people think it's temporary. Here's how I personally feel about this, and you are totally free to agree or disagree with me. I hope it's permanent. What makes you say that? Sunny has been shown throughout the movie to be an extremely unique individual with a lot of potential who only wished to do the right thing when no one else was brave enough to do so. Her becoming an alicorn provides some relatability to when Twilight became one, even if it's a massive spit in her face. Two characters with a motive of learning more about friendship along with having an extreme sense of independence for what they strive to achieve. Sunny, as if she passed a test, like like when Twilight was able to complete the spell that Starswell couldn't, she reunified the three species all because of her courage and unprejudiced mindset. Now that she has this new form, it gives her a fresh new perception on Equestria that she still has a lot more to explore and learn about. And that makes me very excited to see where Generation 5 goes next. And so should you too. Yes, you, watching this video. At least give the future show of Gen 5 the chance it deserves. Let and try and prove itself. With the three species of ponies back together again, it was such a breathtaking scene to take in. Seeing all of the locations we've been through go through the same positive change was wonderful too. But when the balloon guy finally comes down to Earth, this happens. Hey guys, what did I miss? Wow, that was a brisk end to the movie. Okay, that was strange. Whew. So, repeat this after me, fluff butts, and if this is your first time watching my reviews, here's what you need to say. Was it a yay or a nay? So, say it with me now. Was it a yay or a nay? Well, guys, if you've managed to stick around for this long, you would surely know my answer by now. No matter how huge the continuity holes are that need to be filled in, some questionable performances, and a second act that felt rather rushed, 
A New Generation was overall a splendid movie. It kept throwing plenty of thrills at me, and seeing what awaits us all in the future, I am totally on board with what's in store. I can't believe I'm saying this, Fluff Butts. After all this time, I am going to give A New Generation a vibrant, sparkling green yay. A New Generation is quite possibly the best pilot that this new generation could have asked for. The plot consistency with the many questions laid on the table concerning when, where and why this world came to be is a bit flimsy and is what ruins the movie for me. But everything about those problems can be piled up with the many positives that this film provides. Sunny Hitch, Izzy and Zip's performances always stole the spotlight. Pip though, she needs more development in order for me to like her. The the story was certainly somewhat cliche with the typical feel-good vibes and teamwork antics, but it worked efficiently for a satisfactory outcome. The side characters were addressed finely, and all of the songs featured were masterful in their own way. However, I disliked the involvement of our red potato antagonist. Sprout's motives were ultimately annoying, and the second half of the movie felt too hasty for my liking. I could almost smell the making it up as they went along with it feeling during the main five's exit. But I got to say, I was wholly pleased with what the makers did on this film. You've got to respect what they did to try and keep old and possible new fans content with their vision for the future of My Little Pony. I, and hopefully many others of you watching this video now, cannot wait for the show to be released and discover what is going to happen next. I award My Little Pony a new generation a yay, and a 7 out of 10. Well, Fluff Butts, for the celebration of Gen 5, I am going to be starting a fresh and brand new tier list. So, everyone, I'm going to have to give a new generation a solid B rank on the Generation 5 tier list. This movie was an entertaining experience for those who are willing to open up to a new spin on the franchise. My anticipation for what's coming next has remained intact. Oh my god, thank you so much for watching Fluff But I seriously hope you have enjoyed this this mega review on the movie and I literally don't know what else to say right now It's currently like 11 in the evening and I'm recording this video Do be sure to like this video comment your thoughts down below on what you thought of the movie and subscribe to my channel for more exciting content coming soon and I need to take a rest. I'll see you all very soon Goodbye! <laughs> Kill me!